Thank you, Gersh, and thank you to the Society for allowing uh, me a few minutes of your time to talk about one of my favorite passions, which is craniofacial distraction. I have one uh, conflict of interest to disclose. I'm the co-founder of Osteo, which is a small medical device company that, that in fact, is trying to overcome what, what I see as the major limitation to distraction uh, currently, which is the transcutaneous nature of the hardware. And so we're in the process of creating a fully buried magnetic distractor. And I don't believe that anything I'm gonna to say today uh, interferes with that or is a conflict, but uh, feel free to, uh, to call me on it if you think that is uh, not the case. And given that this is a neurosurgical audience, I thought I'd, I'd really focus in on cranial distraction. And, and I feel like there's a, an answer to all types of craniosynostosis surgery with distraction. And I'm gonna start where I think uh, cranial facial distraction or cranial distraction has caught on the most, which is in the posterior cranial vault for the treatment of syndromic craniosynostosis, really a technique uh, first published by our colleagues in Birmingham, England, and, and really one that has taken over, uh, I think, the world of craniofacial surgery. And when I talk about posterior cranial vault distraction, this is a diagram of the procedure that I'm really referring to, which is uh, a, a posterior cranial osteotomy uh, with a transverse portion of that osteotomy, usually just below the transverse sinus, and then low barrel stave osteotomies in the low occiput that are green stick out fractured to gradually allow for an increase in the volume of the posterior occipital cranial base, one of the areas where we need the volume the most. Uh, and so this is the procedure I refer to as posterior cranial vault distraction. And I think one thing that, that the cranial distraction uh, literature suffers from is when people refer to various procedures, uh, we often call them by the same name and, 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 can, and in fact referring to different procedures, but this is what I refer to as posterior cranial vault distraction. And our center at, in Philadelphia has published a great deal on this subject. And uh, I was just gonna highlight some of the data that we've published. Uh, and really some of the benefits of posterior cranial vault distraction are still, in my opinion, theoretical. Um, and and the, the fact that we have a vascularized osteotomy, I think is of significant benefit, much lower risk of infection. The gradual expansion of the soft tissues, often referred to as distraction histiogenesis, means that we can create additional intracranial volume, perhaps uh, beyond uh, that which can be obtained with a single uh, stage cranial vault expansion procedure. Uh, and still get the cranial uh, envelope closed, the soft tissues closed on top of our uh, osteotomies. And then of course, the facilitation of the growth of new bone uh, is incredibly important to posterior cranial vault and really all types of distraction osteogenesis. Technically speaking, we've shown that posterior cranial vault distraction leads to shorter operative times relative to its corresponding open procedure. And of course, there's no need for bone grafting. There are also significant clinical benefits to distractions, safer perioperative morbidity profile, uh, greater reliability in syndromic and non-syndromic populations with regards to significant expansion and retention of that expansion, uh, and then decreased reoperation rates in syndromic craniosynostosis for ICP. There also, we've also published improvements in anterior cranial aesthetics, even though we're, we're operating in the posterior uh, vault. And, and again, we've gone beyond just the clinical observations showing uh, indeed craniometric benefits, greater uh, intracranial volumetric expansion relative to other uh, acute techniques, um, greater volumetric gains in the posterior fossa, again, an area where we need the volume most, decreased incidence of um, Chiari malformations. And, and again, that was proven radiologically. And this audience, of course, knows that the radio radiologic Evidence is not uh, the most important evidence of Chiari, but has been shown by our group and others. And again, what are we doing and where are we doing it? And the most important differences in posterior cranial vault distraction are in the posterior cranial base. So uh, I, I thought I'd share some data from our center about what we were performing before PVDO came along. And what you see here is that our center was doing a lot of uh, open cranial vault remodeling and that open cranial vault remodeling was leading to the need for additional repeat open cranial vault remodeling, as you can see in this uh, 
uh, here where you have very high rates of repeat surgery being done pre-PBDO. And then in 2009, shortly after White and colleagues published on PBDO, we came up with this cranial algorithm, which has been our um, preferred algorithm for treatment of syndromic craniosynostosis since that time. And we uh, essentially perform uh, functionally important surgery earlier than three months as needed. PBDO at about three to six, really to nine months of age, depending on the type of syndromic craniosynostosis. And then we have a growing cohort of patients who've had nothing additional until having their monoblock or other mid-face advancement op uh, operation during the period of mixed dentition. A smaller cohort do go on to need frontal orbital advancement or repeat PBDO. And so here's uh, our treatment algorithm data from our center in the era of PBDO showing fewer operations uh, early in life with uh, uh, a, a uh, smattering of frontal orbital advancement versus mid-face surgery as the kids grow up. We published uh, a uh, survival curve uh, several years ago. We're in the process of publishing a follow-up to that, which proves the same thing, which is with PVDO, we have an increased amount of time before the first frontal surgery in the syndromic population, again, very nice to be able to arrive in the period of mixed dentition in our syndromic patients having a virgin territory to operate in to do something like a frontofacial advancement of monoblock. In this case, sort of demonstrates some of the benefits of uh, those uh, of PBDO in the early uh, patient. This is a, an eight week old with Sather Chotzen with severe OSA furry brachycephaly. And we'd like to, cre uh, to solve both of that patient's problems with one surgery. And we did that with a uh, posterior vault distraction osteogenesis and then used uh, surgical navigation to fire a transfacial pin. I'll go through this rather quickly, uh, but uh, fired the transfacial pin and then hooked it up to an anterior cranial uh, vault distractor to perform facial distraction across open facial sutures. Here we are firing that transfacial pin. We've already done our posterior cranial vault distraction, as you can see here. And then we hook up this transfacial pin to an anterior cranial vault distractor and push the mid-face forward to relieve the patient of her uh, mid-facial constriction leading to um, the obstructive sleep apnea. And then if you look at this axial CT overlay of the cranial base in this patient, you can see the tremendous green is the post-op, purple is the pre-op. You can see the tremendous amount of volume we've been able to achieve in the posterior cranial base and the significant anterior mid-facial advancement achieved with distraction across open facial sutures. And here she is a year after surgery. She's actually seven years of age now and has had no additional surgery. So now I'd like to shift gears away from syndromic synostosis to show some of the solutions we've created in the anterior non-syndromic cases. And we'll start with unicoronal craniosynostosis. Here's a typical three-year-old with anterior plagiocephaly due to right unicoronal craniosynostosis. And we designed an osteotomy, which was loosely based on uh, work by Zhang Wu Choi uh, out of uh, San Medical Center in South Korea, where we do an essentially a two-thirds frontal orbital advancement, keeping this, the frontal segment vascularized, but doing all of the typical osteotomies that one would do for a frontal orbital advancement, utilizing, of course, ultrasonic scalpel technology, as I've shown in the bottom right. But you can see we have a perforating osteotomy in the contralateral frontal region at the transition point of the right frontal retrusion. We do high barrel stave osteotomies as well as low orbital barrel stave osteotomies to unfurl the constricted cranial vault. And then through a terional window incision, uh, excuse me, exposure, we're able to do a uh, superorbital osteotomy across this venoid wing. And so here's a, a, a radiographs of this patient immediately postoperatively, and you can see the tremendous expansion we get with anterior cranial vault distraction. And here this patient is in consolidation. We consolidate the patients for about twice as long as we go through the activation phase. And again, if you look at the periorbital aesthetics that distraction is able to obtain for us, you see an improvement not only in the bony position, but in fact, in the soft tissues of the periorbital region, the brow asymmetry is improved. Here she is just after having the distractors removed. 
And again, look at these photos of the patient's periorbita, preoperative in the upper left, three months after surgery, and then a year after surgery. You can see the improvement in the, in the periorbital aesthetics and the, um, the fissures, uh, both the vertical and horizontal height of the orbits have been corrected. And then here, this patient is at five years of age demonstrating maintenance of that soft tissue correction, which is as important as the bony correction, given the fact that we see each other's soft tissues, not our bones. This is a different patient, but I wanted to show a post-operative CT scan. I generally don't get post-operative CT scans on my patients. This CT scan was done for other reasons, but this is another patient with right unicoronal craniosynostosis. And I show this CT scan just to say that some of our patients develop a neosuture-like structure on post-operative CT, which again, I, I, I point out simply for interest sake, I, I don't claim that this neo-suture behaves like a suture, but as my colleague John Wu Choi has, has demonstrated, you get some correction of the anterior vault uh, deviation that you see with unicronal synostosis that may be corrected. And one of the reasons that it may be corrected is because of the creation of a neo-suture. And again, the endoscopic strip group has also shown creation of a neo-suture. Again, I'm gonna go through some of this data rather quickly because we're short on time, but we uh, are also vexed by the post-operative strabismus rates we see in our unicoronal open technique. And we've shown that those strabismus rates are in fact corrected with the frontal orbital distraction procedure relative to our open procedure. Moving on to metopic craniosynostosis, we've uh, created a, a similar procedure for metopic that we have for unicoronal. This is a young man with uh, moderate trigonocephaly anteriorly due to metopic craniosynostosis. And just like with the unicoronal technique, we do a strip craniectomy. And then all of the typical osteotomies that one would do for a frontal orbital advancement, leaving though the frontal region vascularized and pedicled in the mid region of the frontal bones in order to allow for a decreased incidence of potentially growth disturbance as well as um, infection. Uh, we stretch the middle uh, metopic cr strip craniectomy region, place a bone graft, and then place bitemporal distractors across that in a collinear anterior posterior vector in order to limit our narrowing of that frontal region as we proceed through the distraction. And here that patient is after removing the distractors, briefly demonstrating a second case. Again, we have to uh, do some perforating osteotomies at the coronal region to allow for a gradual bending of that to create a more reasonable and gradual, more natural, if you will, uh, frontal orbital reshaping. And here this patient is three years after surgery. So I went through that rather quickly because of um, uh, time constraints, but the osteotomies for the metopic are similar to that for unicoronal, but performed in a bilateral manner. We do a narrow metopic strip craniectomy, stretch the dural and place an interpositional bone graft, and then do partial thickness or perforating osteotomies at the coronal to allow for a gradual bending or expansion. And then a, again, a, an important technical point, the vector of distraction should be straight into your posterior without narrowing minimize the risk of recreation of trigonocephaly. We really believe strongly in springs for sagittal craniosynostosis, and we've done uh, just shy of 100 cases at CHOP now. We generally place the springs around three months of age and take them out about four months later. Um, we do about two, or two to four springs, uh, generally placing uh, three springs, and we, we very carefully study the Newton force that we uh, of the springs that we place. We've uh, published a great deal on springs showing different values uh, for different uh, metrics, but uh, showing nice resolution using cranial index as a, as a measure. We show that uh, the later the springs are placed, the less positive the change in the cranial vault uh, CI. And uh, we haven't been able to show that the change in the maximal spring force or total spring force has caused a change in our ability to reshape the vault, but uh, I'm still confident that uh, springs matter and how those springs are placed probably matters, but we just haven't been able to show that yet. And so I'll just show a few cases. This is a three month old with uh, classic sagittal craniosynostosis, frontal bossing, occipital bulleting. We take the sagittal strip out, I morselize it, put the springs in, and then I put 
portions of that morselized cranial bone back into position beneath the cranial springs to promote osteogenesis under the springs. And you can see this is a day after surgery. You can see the amount of cranial expansion that's already been achieved in one day. Here the patient is before surgery and then about four months after surgery, just after spring removal. And you can see already some resolution of the frontal bossing. Uh, a significant variable that I can't explain is an increase in urinal height uh, that the springs uh, tend to give us. And that's something that's not talked about as much as it probably should be. And then just some preoperative to postoperative uh, images showing uh, resolution of the scaphocephaly as well as increase in urinal height again. I think that's talked about less than it should be. A couple other examples. This, this is a case where uh, we use two springs. Here he is two years out and then a two month old male, two springs, and then one year post op and two years after surgery. We recently published in the journal of craniofacial surgery a head to head comparison using just uh, CI because it's the most commonly published on uh, metric in the cranial region showing uh, that uh, early on, it does look like there's a slight benefit to open surgery. But if you look at the data over time, cranial shape tends to get better over time with minimally invasive techniques and worse over time with open cranial vault techniques, leading to what we believe is a slight benefit towards something like springs or stripless helmeting. And then of course, distraction can be applied to, I think very readily to multi-suture cranius and osteosis. And I'll show just one example of that. This is a three week old male with bicoronal plus sagittal cranius and osteosis. And you can see here a fairly severe uh, manifestation of those, uh, of that multi-suture cranius and osteosis. And so we took this young, young patient to the operating room at six weeks of age, did bilateral frontal orbital osteotomies, as I demonstrated for the metopic and for the unicronal, uh, and then did a sagittal strip craniectomy and placed a distractor across that, really maximally expanded all of these, uh, consolidated the patient, and then got a CT scan shortly after removing the devices about four months after they were placed. And here this patient is at that, at that age with uh, much improved cranial uh, volume as well as shape. And here that patient is at four years of age, having had no additional cranial surgery in a normal school, uh, meeting all developmental milestones. And, and in fact, seems to be a fairly bright uh, young man. So uh, in summary, I, I think uh, we've, we've shown that uh, there are distraction uh, protocols and ways that uh, one can manage just about any type of craniosynostosis. It's a tool in our armamentarium. It's not, I'm not here to say that it's the way to do anything, but I think it's an absolutely wonderful tool in the craniofacial armamentarium. Uh, and, and like is, uh, and, and where it can be used is one uh, where the nuances are still yet to be worked out. And so uh, with that, uh, I'll simply say thank you uh, to the audience and uh, certainly will be available for any questions. Thank you, Professor Taylor. That, that's an outstanding um, summary of um, where we are right now with the uh, distractors. Um, I, I was quite impressed by the uh, results and the uh, combination of the uh, posterior distractors with the anterior distractors. And I think that um, will become more common um, as uh, the techniques become um, uh, enshrined in uh, our current practice. I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, so also De Karan from India, Cochin uh, asked uh, about posterior calvarial distractions, whether there's any role for going below the transverse sinus and how do you handle uh, large emissary veins at the torcula when doing the surgery? Yeah, very carefully uh, is the answer <laughs> to the second part of the question. Um, so, so I think the question really is, uh, does the height of the low transverse osteotomy matter? And I think that matters uh, most if the surgeons are unable to perform the low barrel stave osteotomies below the transverse osteotomy. Um, and so I think the, the height of that posterior low osteotomy matters less if those posterior vertical barrel staves are able to be performed and then those barrel staves, of course, need to be green stick out fractured. And, and I, am, I prefer to lag those to the transport segment uh, with 
I use 3O PDS suture so that as my transport segment is transported posteriorly, those low occipital barrel staves are, are rotated out to increase the amount of volume in the low occipital vault. And, and I think that's a really uh, important technical aspect of that surgery that is not talked about enough. Now, if, if the low occipital barrel staves are not gonna be performed, I think it does matter how low that osteotomy is done. And I would encourage folks, if they're not doing the low barrel stave osteotomies or for whatever reason, those osteotomies are abandoned because of bleeding or um, man, uh, problems with managing some of the low uh, trans transosseous veins, um, then, I, then I think I would, I would recommend that that osteotomy be performed as low as can safely be done. Okay. Do you usually go below the transverse sinus or stay above? I, I would say typically uh, we, we try to go just below the transverse sinus, um, although in, in, in the other uh, technical aspect of where, where we do it would, that would, might be worth mentioning is how we do it. We typically do all the other osteotomies just with a, with a typical uh, side cutting burr, but the low transverse uh, osteotomy, we will often uh, perform with, uh, with either a, a rongeur or some other bone biting, you know, very slow meticulous um, osteotomy technique simply to, to make sure we're not injuring the sinus or if we do have an injury that we can get to it rather quickly. Okay, I've got a couple of questions which are related. Um, so for, you know, because of the time, uh, brief answers. So John Castle asked in bicoronal synostosis, why is a posterior distraction necessary? All the sutures in the back are, of the head are open. Won't the brain do the distraction that it needs? And just in the same vein, there's a second question, uh, very similar from Olufemi Ajani. Why do you choose two procedure solution when one surgery alternative is available with similar results? So, you're, yeah, you're... I, I guess the big question is, are similar results being shown? I, I am not aware that there's been a head to head comparison. And I, I would argue that I, I don't know that we that we have similar results until we have a head to head comparison showing um, you know, developmental outcomes as well as cranial shape outcomes, uh, I, I think the jury is still out. So I don't uh, think that, you know, I guess I, I would say to the, I, both questioners, I, I don't know that we have a one-stage solution with similar results. Uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, two, two things that I, I guess I, I think are, are still controversies that haven't been shown or what the developmental outcomes are from a single stage approach. And I assume both of the questioners are referring to strip and helmet. Uh, and then secondly, I, I feel like the jury is out on control of turicephaly, which is another thing with the posterior vault distraction with a posterior inferior vector on that. I think we have very, we've shown very nice control of turicephaly. Uh, and, and again, the group from Boston has shown some control of turicephaly with strip and helmet. But I think the jury is still out on ultimately uh, the two most important variables, which are uh, control of cranial shape, as well as uh, developmental outcomes from the two approaches. 